We are coming on the air tonight from the spin room right here in Miami, just a few hours away now from tonight's NBC News Republican presidential debate. We are live where it is happening, and we're going to get all those candidates as soon as they get off stage. Right now, we're teeing it up because there are five people getting ready to take that stage. But you know who's not going to be there? The overwhelming front runner, former President Trump. He's doing his own thing about 20 minutes away as the candidates are making all of their last minute preps. So how much will those decisive wins for abortion rights on election night last night change their plans of attack? We've got it covered from every angle. Then the former president's daughter on the stand today in that civil fraud trial against her father's company. Her moves in court to try to distance herself from the Trump empire and what to expect in the trial's next phase. We'll take it live outside court. Plus, potentially dangerous chemicals now filling the air after a huge explosion at a Texas plant. People being told to stay inside, schools being evacuated. We've got our team live on the ground in just a minute. Then talks of a possible pause in the fighting in Gaza with Israeli troops now in the heart of Gaza City as they're playing a kind of high stakes game of cat and mouse with Hezbollah up north. We've got the latest on the tensions in the region. Plus, the FDA approving a new weight loss drug said to be better than anything on the market. But how safe is it? And how much is it going to cost you? We've got that later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And tonight we are coming on the air live from Miami, bringing the show to you from the spin room of the third Republican presidential debate hosted by NBC News. Later on uh, tonight, I'm going to walk you around what this looks like. And let me tell you, it is going to get packed. Right now it is empty. Boy, is it going to look a lot different just about five hours from now as those Republican candidates, the five candidates on stage, come off of it as they face off for their party's nomination. Check it out. This is a live look at where we're going to see them. This is the Adrian Ars Performing Arts Center. Some 1,500 people will fill all of those empty chairs. They're going to start pouring in here really any minute. It is going to be a lot. It's going to be active. It's going to be interesting. It's coming after a lot of prep work from these candidates, too. Check them out earlier today, getting a walkthrough of how things are going to go down, what it's going to look like. They're checking mics. They're checking podiums. They're checking levels, doing all the behind-the-scenes things that go into this. And you can see who it's going to be here. The smallest field of candidates that we've had yet. Chris Christie, Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, Vivek Ramaswamy, Tim Scott as well. And listen, smaller field means maybe more time for each of them to try to make their case to a Republican electorate that right now feels pretty firmly behind former President Donald Trump. That is what the polls have showed right now. Former President Trump, he is not going to be here at all, actually. He's going to be down the road in Hialeah. He's holding his own rally outside Miami while his rivals battle it out on stage. You can see people already outside there earlier today. Their American flags are about to show you. They're dressed in red, white, and blue. All of it happening against the backdrop of what we've seen in the last 24 hours. The elections in Virginia, Ohio, Mississippi, Kentucky. Democrats winning big with abortion rights being the difference maker in some of these key races, with these results really setting the stage for tonight's debate and the 2024 election. Listen to what some voters are telling our teams in the field. Watch. Top thing on my mind, maybe um, have a better economy. I see that we are in a lot of debt right now. I, I feel that the immigration is really big to me. Immigrants are what make America, honestly. We're in a world of, of instability that we're all facing. It worries me a lot. I don't feel like the government should be telling us how to live our lives. Dasha Burns is live for us here in Miami as well. We've got Ryan Nobles up in New Hampshire talking with voters with the primary there coming up in just a couple months. Vaughn Hilliard is out with former President Trump in Hialeah. And our Monica Alba is outside the White House with more on where Democrats go from here. Dasha, let me start with you. So here we are. We're doing it. We're in Miami. The candidates are here. There's staff in the building. We know that. And we know we are just a couple of hours away from start time here. What are you watching for? Give us a viewer's guide to what we should expect. Well, look, Hallie, let's think about what happened yesterday. Voters sent a pretty resounding message on the issue of abortion. And that message said that they are pretty far away from the Republican position on this, the limits that Republicans have tried uh, to put on, on abortion across the country. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays tonight, because you've got candidates like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who uh, issued a six-week abortion ban here in the state of Florida. You've got Tim Scott, who has said he would 
sign a national abortion ban. Then you have Nikki Haley, who has definitely taken the most moderate position on the stage out of the candidates that are going to be there tonight. So I'm watching for that. I'm also watching to see uh, how Haley and DeSantis, the two that are now neck and neck, behave with one another. DeSantis is coming in with the wind at his back after that really big endorsement from Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds, perhaps the biggest endorsement of the primary. But Nikki Haley has had the biggest climb since the last debate. So how will those two interact? Act and how will they play with voters and with those in the room? It's going to be an interesting night, Hallie. Uh, interesting for sure. Um, a lot of people, I think, watching to see that Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley mashup. Thank you, Dasha. Ryan Nobles, let me go to you up in New Hampshire because you are, I think, where, where it's going to matter so much, right? You, we have our colleague in Iowa posted up, Shaq Brewster, with some voters there because the question is going to be, okay, fine, we're going to have two hours of a debate tonight. Is anything going to actually change people's minds? If people are even watching, which, of course, one would hope they would, it's democracy in action. But given where Donald Trump sits in the polls, what are the people that you're talking to there in New Hampshire look for? Are they open to being persuaded? Do they want to hear something specific on stage tonight? Yeah, Hallie, it's really interesting because usually at this stage in a presidential contest, New Hampshire voters are really dialed in on everything that's happening with the upcoming primary. And in this race, because so much of it is focused on Donald Trump, uh, all the other candidates really haven't been given the level of attention that you would normally expect at a race at this stage. And, and we talked to quite a few New Hampshire voters earlier today who are interested in what's going to take place here tonight. But the big question is, will it change their mind? Take a listen. I think it's a farce. There's really nobody in there that gets me excited. It's a lot of noise. It's a lot of noise right now. I'm not, I'm not sure why they're going through the process when Trump's so far ahead. So you heard uh, those voters say what is really kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to this debate here tonight, or more aptly, the elephant not in the room, and that is Donald Trump. He continues to be the driving force behind this Republican primary, and even though he's yet to participate in any of these debates, it's really hard to remove him from this conversation. So I'm going to be very interested. Tonight, I'm going to be in a room with about 50 or 60 New Hampshire Republicans. We're going to yeah. watch their reaction to this in real time. And the big question I've, I have, Hallie, or are is anyone on this stage able to convince these voters to back away from Donald Trump and support one of these candidates? That'll be one of the big things I'll be looking for tonight. Hallie? Yeah, you and me both, friend. I think a lot of people will be watching that. We're going to be looking for you tonight in our pre-show coming up in just a couple of hours. And then, of course, after the debate as well. Thank you, sir. I want to bring in Vaughn Hillier, who's out now in Hialeah. We mentioned that is where former President Trump is going to be holding his own rally. He's picking up an endorsement, Vaughn, from uh, the Arkansas governor, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, perhaps familiar to people as the former press secretary over at the White House. And this is a pretty intentional spot that the former president is picking, right? He could be at Mar-a-Lago. He's not. He's specifically in Hialeah. Talk us through that piece of it. Right. It's at the heart of Donald Trump's argument for why he's not on that, on that debate stage tonight, Hallie, and that is that he has such a significant lead over his Republican rivals that the focus of the Republican Party should be on Joe Biden. Of course, we're 12 months out from what would be a general election, but for Donald Trump, Hialeah, we're about 10 miles down the road from where you are right now in Miami, but Hialeah is a heavily Cuban-American population here. This is in Miami-Dade County. It's at the heart of, for Donald Trump, what would be a an important county, an important pickup here to maintain his support in the state of Florida. For Donald Trump here on stage tonight, you should expect to hear the gamut. Last night, of course, there were some key Republican losses in the elections from Virginia over to Kentucky. And Donald Trump actually previewed his speech tonight on a conservative radio show this afternoon in which he suggested there were, quote, improprieties with the elections. Of course, we heard that in 2020. We heard that in 2022. Donald Trump providing no examples. But Donald Trump just days also after appearing in that lower Manhattan courtroom testifying in that civil lawsuit filed by the New York Attorney General against him, his two sons, and the Trump Organization testifying, we should expect Donald Trump to really hone in on the message that this is the time for the Republican Party, including his key Republican rivals, to rally around him because the Republican Party, the conservative movement, the MAGA movement is under attack. This is in Donald Trump's words, and it is him that is not only the only person 
person who is victim of this, but the entire movement at large. And if they do not rally around him now, Democrats will maintain control of the White House. That is the type of message we should expect from Donald Trump tonight. Of course, he holds about a 25 percentage point lead in Iowa, but there's a big two months ahead for him here. And it is a decisive decision of his not to go mano a mano with any of those yeah. other candidates on that stage just down the road from here, Hallie. Yeah, with the uh, head of the Republican National Committee suggesting that she doesn't think perhaps the former president will do any of the debates here in the primary cycle. Vaughn Hilliard, live for us there. We'll be checking back in with you. Thank you. We talked about the big impact that the fight to protect abortion access has had on the elections that we brought you here on this show just 24 hours ago. And here we are tonight. Big win for Democrats, right? Powered specifically by that fight to protect abortion rights. We saw it in Ohio, where voters put in place protections constitutionally in that state. We saw it in ruby red Kentucky, right, where the Democratic governor there, popular guy, Andy Bashir, held on to his office in part by running a campaign that put abortion rights front and center. We saw it in Virginia, abortion not technically on the ballot there, but you did have this through line of the Republican governor hoping to flip the state house red in order to, in part, pass a 15-week abortion ban, with some exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother, that Glenn Youngkin cast largely as a kind of middle ground. Instead, the state house went blue, right? So the question is, big night for Democrats. We heard that from Vice President Kamala Harris even late this afternoon. Can that sustain into 2024? Let me bring in Monica Alba live for us in Washington. Human, I think you got that question to the vice president there. What does last night say about the 2024 campaign? Walk us through it, right, how Democrats are seeing it and some of the other nuances here. Exactly, Hallie, because remember how we started this week, which was with the news of that polling in the New York Times and Siena that really showed the president not doing well against former President Trump in some key battleground states. And everybody from the Biden campaign to the White House said, look, the polls don't go vote, in their words, voters vote. Let's see what happens on Tuesday. And they tried to make this argument today that President Biden's values and his agenda, some of that was on the ballot and that for Democratic victories, they are trying to tie this through line. But of course, his name wasn't anywhere on the ballot in any of these states. And when you do look at some of the exit polling, it shows that many people are still concerned about an 80, almost 81 year old president seeking reelection. So that is the tension that exists here. But I was able to ask the vice president today what her takeaway was from the Democratic successes overnight and what she thinks it could mean for her election with President Biden next year. Take a listen to how she responded. I think the American people made clear that they are prepared to stand for freedom. So it was a good night, and the president and I obviously have a lot of work to do to earn our reelection, but I am confident we're going to win. The vice president nodding there, perhaps, to some of that polling that had been concerning. But look, Biden campaign officials continue to say we're a year away. A lot can change. But the vice president has been one of the lead messengers on the issue of abortion rights and abortion access. And that is something clearly they will continue to have her be the voice on because she was the one responding really for the administration today. We didn't hear from President Biden on the election results today, Hallie, though he will be traveling to Illinois tomorrow and I think he will be talking about how he did make some calls last night to some of the victors yeah. and where they do see some bright spots here as they both acknowledge there's a lot they need to do to convince voters and help voters understand what they say they've been able to accomplish when it comes to key legislation. Hallie. Monica Alba, so many threads to pull on here as we hit the gas on the 2024 campaign. Thank you so much. We have so much more to come from here in Miami, but there's a lot of news developing back home and overseas. For that, I want to get to my co-anchor for the day, if you will, my friend Tom Costello, who's back home in Washington with the rest of today's news. Uh, Tom, glad you're there. Thank you for being there. My pleasure. We have a lot happening. Good day, everybody, from Washington. While the former president does his counter-programming against the debate tonight, his daughter, Ivanka, has been on the stand today, trying to distance herself from her father's business empire that is wrapped up in that multi-million dollar civil fraud case. You see her walking out of court here just moments ago. She's the last member of the family to testify, and her lawyers question why she was, as they say, dragged there in the first place after attempts to get her out of appearance, appearance and she's not a defendant in the case. Ivanka continually repeated she was not involved in the company or her father's financial statements. 
which really are at the crux of this trial, with the Attorney General arguing that those financial statements were wildly inflated. We bring in now NBC's Rahema Ellis, who has been covering this trial. Rahema, so the prosecution wrapped up its examination of Ivanka, and now it's the defense's turn. Was there any big takeaway today? I think only the big takeaway was what people had been expecting, and that is that Ivanka Trump would come into this courthouse and she would be very different in her demeanor from her father and her brothers and that she was very calm. But at the same time, as you say, she distanced herself from any connection with the financial statements. It was interesting because at the start of it, she said she was very much involved in a couple of properties, one of them being the old post office in there in Washington, D.C., that you're very familiar with, Tom, that was turned into a luxury hotel. But when asked about email, between her and financial institutions for the financing of that, the Deutsche Bank, she she acknowledged that there were those emails, but in terms of the details, she said, I do not recall. She said that repeatedly, many, many, many times. At the end of her direct examination, when she was asked on cross-examination by the Trump attorneys, she was asked specifically about these finances, and she said, when questioned about, were you responsibility, was your responsibility for preparing those statements? She said, no. Reviewing those statements, no. Approving those statements, no. That's the image that and the statement that the defense wanted to leave everyone lit with. But just a short while ago, the state attorney general, Letitia James, came out and give, gave her take of what happened in here today. Take a listen. She was disciplined. She was controlled. Um, and she was very courteous. But her testimony... Um, raises some questions with regards to its credibility, which will, which will be a question for the finder of fact. And there was also something we heard from her father, Donald Trump, today earlier. He, on social media, put out a statement, and that was this. We've got a full screen of it for you. He said, no victims, no defaults, conservative financial statements, 100% disclaimer clause, corrupt AG, Trump-hating judge equals no case. Well, the court certainly doesn't think there's no case. As you know, there's already been a summary judgment of libel and fraud against Trump and his organization. But now the defense begins its portion of this case starting tomorrow. Tom? Uh, good point. He has already been convicted. And this was the last witness for the prosecution. Now it's the defense's turn. What should we expect from defense? We should expect them to mount a vigorous defense as much as they can. Donald Trump, as you saw in the tweet, uh, in the social media tweet just a moment ago, he's saying there is no case here. He's saying there were no victims. He says that the bank was paid. He says that this uh, evaluation of property, in some sense, is subjective, and valuations go up and valuations go down. But the attorney general's office says it not so fast, that they said that there was a pattern of attempting to deceive people in terms of the value of his property and according to the attorney general that's fraud tom nbc's rahama ellis in new york thank you rahama to texas now in a large chemical explosion at a manufacturing plant there right now residents living nearby are being asked to stay inside but a shelter in place has been lifted smoke from the fire has been visible for miles we just learned the firefighters have now been able to get control of most of the fire with just a few hot spots remaining and we're also told one employee was injured with what's described as minor burns other employees and students at a nearby school were safely evacuated this is happening in Shepherd, Texas. That's about 60 miles outside of Houston. And people living within about a mile radius of the fire are being told to avoid unnecessary act outdoor activity for now. A main highway remains closed to traffic. To the Middle East, and we are learning that the United States is in talks with Israel and Qatar about a possible pause in the fighting in Gaza. That according to a pair of foreign diplomats familiar with the matter. The goal would be to allow more aid into Gaza and perhaps release more hostages. It comes as Israel says its troops are now, quote, in the heart of Gaza City. Israel's defense minister says forces are carrying out coordinated attacks, all while thousands of Palestinians continue to move away from Gaza City and push south, where Israel has told them to head for, quote, their own safety.
لا يوجد أي خطر بالطريق. The view from the ground in Gaza today is the fifth day. The evacuation corridor has been open. Some Palestinians carried makeshift white flags in the hope that they would not be attacked. In Washington, the White House is cautioning Israel not to reoccupy Gaza after the war, something Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu seemed to suggest just yesterday. Here's the Secretary of State today, Antony Blinken. It is imperative that um, the Palestinian people uh, be central to, uh, to governance uh, in, uh, in Gaza and uh, in the West Bank as well, uh, and that, again, uh, we don't see uh, a reoccupation. All right, well, let's bring in NBC's Aaron McLaughlin, who is in Tel Aviv. Aaron, what can you tell us about this possible pause in fighting? What might it look like? Well, Tom, a senior Arab source with knowledge of these ongoing negotiations telling NBC News that the negotiations have reached a, quote, critical stage. These negotiations having been gone on for a few weeks now, a, a diplomat telling NBC News that what would be required is a one to three day pause uh, in exchange for the release of 10 to 15 hostages. That pause would allow for a cessation of the violence, more aid to get into Gaza, uh, but also give Hamas, according to this diplomat, time to try and figure out where all of the remaining hostages are, because apparently they do not know. Now, in terms of this reporting, uh, NBC News put it to Mark Regev, a senior advisor to the Israeli prime minister. He did not discount it. He said that we, quote, have to be cautious that a hostage release is possible, uh, but that it would come because of Israeli military pressure being exerted on Hamas. Uh, nothing to announce yet, he said. Tom. Well, 10 to 15 potential hostages being released is well short of the 240 or so who are being held. Uh, the U.S. is saying, though, that it opposes any sort of Israeli reoccupation of Gaza after the war, right? Uh, is reoccupation looking like it might happen? Well, it certainly was the concern when earlier this week the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu telling ABC News that Israel intends to maintain security oversight over Gaza once this war is complete. A lot of people wondering if he meant reoccupation when he said that. Other Israeli officials quickly clarifying those remarks. Mark Regev, his senior advisor, saying that essentially what they're looking at is something more fluid, more flexible, that Israel would not have a permanent security presence inside Gaza, but would reserve the right to be able to go into Gaza to address any security issues in order to stop Hamas from emerging if and when this war actually ends. Now, that's the Israeli position. The Israeli position is in agreement with the United States position uh, on the issue of governance. Israel says that they do believe that the Palestinians should govern themselves in the event that this war is over. But Secretary Blinken himself said that he believes there needs to be some sort of transition period. It has to be said, though, Tom, that this war right now is in its nascent stages. A lot could happen going forward. There is a serious question mark over whether Ham Hamas can, in fact, be eliminated, as Israel says it intends to do. And the political landscape here in Israel could also change. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is seen as deeply unpopular, and that could be a factor in this picture going forward as well. You so. just anticipated my follow-up question. Tell me, what is the public thinking about Prime Minister Netanyahu a month into this war now? You know, they're deeply dissatisfied, not only with the fact that this was allowed to happen in the first place, that the slaughter of Israeli civilians took place in 16 kibbutzes on October 7th. They're very upset at the security failures, the sequence of events that led up to that horrific day. But they're also upset at present with the way the government handled the situation in the aftermath. A lot of people want to see the Israeli prime minister go. Who would replace him is, again, another open question. Tom.
NBC's Aaron McLaughlin in Tel Aviv. Thank you, Aaron. Coming up from us, the FDA is approving an injectable that some analysts say could become the best-selling drug of all time. How much weight has it really helped people lose? And what are the potential side effects? That's after the break. And later, more of that so-called super fog shutting down Louisiana, inter a Louisiana interstate for a second day in a row. Why something that's really rather rare keeps happening down there in the bayou. Stay with us. Okay, here's a question to ponder. What might Adidas do with all of its leftover Yeezy shoes? It's an issue that's coming up in our five things. First, though, from us, we have a health headline for you. The FDA today approving another weight loss drug with some promising results in clinical trials. It's called ZepBound, and it helped people lose, listen to this, up to 52 pounds in 16 months. That, according to drug maker Eli Lilly, it's better than anything currently on the market, including Ozempic and Wegovy. But it also comes with a hefty price tag. Look at that. A month's supply cost over $1,000 without insurance. Still, some experts believe that ZepBound could eventually become the biggest selling drug ever, with annual sales projected between 25 and $48 billion. Billion dollars. Joining me now, NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar. Natalie, how is this drug different from what's already available out there? So, Tom, let's just get all of this in order and people can keep these names straight. We have Ozempic and Wigovi, and now we have Manjaro and this new name, Zepbound. Manjaro and Zepbound are the same active ingredient, terzepatide, ozempic, and Wigovi have the same active ingredient called semaglutide. And what's happened with ZepBound, the same thing happened with ozempic and Wigovi, and that is first a medication is approved to treat type 2 diabetes, and then lo and behold, they find in clinical trials that the medication also results in weight loss. It gets branded differently, sometimes different dosing, et cetera, and voila, you have a new medication. So in terms of it being similar or different, it's exactly the same as Manjaro, um, and it's slightly different than Ozempic and Wigovi because it, it impacts or targets two different hormones instead of one, but basically achieving uh, the same thing, which is weight loss, tremendous weight loss, as well as treatment yeah. of type 2 diabetes. Okay, so who should be taking this? Who should not be taking it? And I'm, I'm always worried about what we don't know, right? First of all, what are the side effects now? And what about down the road in five years? Are people going to be dealing with some really serious issue? Right. So right now, it is very specifically indicated for individuals who are either obese or who are overweight but have another risk factor for heart disease. So, for example, hypertension, high cholesterol. The most common side effects, Tom, are GI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, typically can be alleviated by going very slowly when increasing the dose, um, you know, staying at a lower dose for a longer period of time. In terms of more serious side effects, there have been cases of pancreatitis, gallbladder issues, kidney issues. There are certain people who have a risk factor for certain thyroid cancers who shouldn't take it. In terms of longer term, we don't really have that data. Um, the medications, even in post-approval, you know, marketing and, and surveillance, yeah. a couple of years, I don't think that there's any dose or cumulative dose-related side effects that we know of, but we don't know. Um, and certainly the drug makers are going to be required to monitor people for potential long-term side effects. Yeah, see, that makes me nervous, you know, because you don't know what you don't know. But let me also ask you this. Once you go on it, are you really on it for life? I mean, can you get off of it if you decide I don't want to be on this anymore? So the medicines don't reset your system so that when you stop it, you are able to either continue, maintain, or achieve the same kind of weight loss. They work in a variety of different ways to achieve weight loss. They slow gastric emptying. They reduce cravings. They do a lot of other things sort of to your metabolic profile, Tom. But when the medicine is stopped, the effect lasts for a couple of weeks, and then it's thought to really revert back to baseline. And one other side effect 
fact that should should be of note because there was some press about it is this concept of slowing uh, the gut down. That's called gastroparesis, and in certain cases, did result in potentially you know significant even even surgical emergencies because of that. So not without potential risk, but they can be used safely in the right population. But they do need to be um, administered by and, and monitored by an expert who knows uh, you know how to safely. Uh, prescribe these medications, Tom. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you very much. Good info. All right, let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you might want to know about tonight. Number one, four current or former L.A. County Sheriff's deputies employees have been found dead in the last two days. That according to law enforcement sources who say the deaths are not connected to one another, detectives and the medical examiner's office are still investigating. If you or someone you know needs help, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. Number two, Northwestern Medicine says doctors there used breast implants to help save the life of a man with severe lung damage for the first time. The 34-year-old smoked and vaped for years, then caught the flu, causing both of his lungs to become infected, and that required him to undergo a double lung transplant. Surgeons used the breast implants to keep his heart in place, and they say it's the first known time a patient has survived with artificial lungs while waiting for the transplant. Number three, Adidas says it might have to write off $320 million worth of Yeezy shoes it never sold. It comes after the company cut ties with rapper Yee, formerly known as Kanye West, after he made anti-Semitic comments over the next few weeks. Adidas will decide if it wants to release the shoes again next year, maybe to raise more money to fight anti-Semitism. Number four, no surprise, Taylor Swift is Apple Music's Artist of the Year. In the first 10 months of 2023, Swift had 65 of her songs reach Apple Music's global daily top 100 more than any other artist. Swift says she is, quote, so honored to receive the award. Number five, this October was the hottest one ever recorded globally. 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the last record for October set back in 2019. Scientists say this new record makes it very likely that 2023 will in fact be the hottest year ever recorded. We know, we felt it. When we come back, the DOJ has just announced arrest today in a high-end brothel network. The info on who federal prosecutors say might have been involved, allegedly. That's coming up later in the hour. We're back, and the super fog situation in the southeastern part of the U.S. is getting even more serious. Now, imagine you're driving on the freeway, and you actually can't see anything. Because when you're caught in the super fog, which is a mix of dense fog and smoke, visibility, look at that, it's near zero. And that's why police in New Orleans had to close a major interstate again today. The smoky conditions have been blamed for a string of recent pileups in Louisiana, including one just yesterday where one person died. NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns joins me now. I've got this Dave Matthews song down on the bayou playing in the back of my head. Uh, what is super fog? Can you explain it a little bit better than I just did? And what will it take for it to dissipate? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we've gone, I've gone 20 years here at NBC, and I've never once before the last two weeks mentioned super fog or even had a super fog event. Of course, we had the horrendous pile up, 150 cars, seven fatalities about two weeks ago. Then yesterday, we had another fatality because of the super fog. So here we are again, and con conditions just haven't changed. So here's New Orleans. Here is the, the fire that's causing all the problems. It's in the peat moss. It's in the marsh. It's a swamp fire. You can't just, like, send fire trucks out there or dump water on it. A lot of it even burns underground. And so the smoke from that would just go in whatever direction the wind's blowing. And lately, it's been out of the south and heading towards the north and towards the northwest right over I-10. So this is the section that they've had to close. And then at night, if, you know, we get the cooler air, especially in the fall when it drops to the ground because the cool air sinks, that's when you get the moisture droplets on top of this. And that's why we just get these really bad visibilities. And it's not widespread either. So will it happen again tonight? High pressure still over the head. There's no rain. There's no clouds. Nothing. So as the night goes on, we do expect 
expect the fog to form. And not just on this area, where we're probably going to have more road closures in the morning, but all through Louisiana and southern Mississippi, we're under a dense fog advisory. Like 1 a.m., it starts to mix out about 9 a.m. It should be all over with by about 10 a.m. And these conditions are going to keep repeating this fall until we get some rain in this region. We are about 99% of the state of Louisiana is in drought. Uh, much of it is in exceptional drought. You know, we talked about the California drought for like decades. This has been going on for about six months now, and it hasn't gotten any better and now spreading into Mississippi, Tom. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if new fires form, and we keep talking about this until we finally get some drenching rain in the south. You know, state troopers always say if you're caught in fog, don't turn on your brights. Use your yeah. fog lights. Uh, what do you do if you're in this kind of super fog? Yeah, well, first off, you have to know that for the potential to be there because this is what they call like patchy fog. You know, you could be totally fine. You're driving for like an hour and then all of a sudden you get to like a bridge or by a river and all of a sudden it's just like driving into pea soup. And that's when people get in trouble. They hit their brakes, they hit a car ahead of them. You don't have the visibility. So they're telling you, you have to first off be ready for the sudden changes in visibility. You know, the low beams, as you mentioned, the high beams just amplify the moisture droplets in the air, make it harder to see. Now, obviously, you have to drive slowly and just try to keep your distance. You want to be able to see the red lights from the tail lights ahead of you, but you don't want to be so you know too close to those. And again, if you know there's you know water or bridges coming, that's where it's going to be the worst. Hopefully tomorrow morning it won't be as bad. Maybe flash the emergency blinkers while you're driving yeah, slowly. A good idea. All right, Bill, thank you very much. Uh, and this super fog is just one of the extreme weather events that we could see more of because of climate change. So some local nonprofits are working to help underserved communities prepare, hoping to keep those neighborhoods safe in the future. NBC News meteorologist Angie Lassman has that story. Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Laura. Hurricane Delta. And Hurricane Ida. Four major hurricanes slamming the Louisiana coast. Three in just a span of two years. These record-breaking storms forcing communities to adapt to the devastating effects of climate change. Unfortunately, I think this is our new normal. The number of storms that we're seeing. And so it's more important than ever that we work with communities to help them better understand what their risk is. In New Orleans' ninth ward, a neighborhood ravaged by Hurricane Katrina, a grassroots effort known as Thrive is preparing underserved communities to combat climate change with their own two hands. We are uh, training uh, uh, people in the community. We are on the ground in the most vulnerable communities trying to serve and make sure they are resilient and sustainable. And what are some of the challenges that New Orleans faces, both economically and then when you add climate change onto that? We know that in the, the, the most affluent parts of New Orleans, it's probably two or three degrees cooler than it is in the less affluent parts of New Orleans. So that heat island effect is real. And we know that the stormwater management tools that we're implementing in the Ninth Ward, many of have already been implemented in some other parts of the city. So we're making sure we're taking uh, those tools that are needed to be resilient and good stewards. A major focus for the nonprofit is flood control as climate change is increasing extreme rainfall events. Students learn to install permeable pavers to keep runoff to a minimum, along with other water mitigation practices. Chris Bell is a Thrive graduate and now owns a landscaping company focusing solely on green infrastructure. What are we mixing, Chris? We are mixing mortar. What are we going to do with this mortar? We're going to put this mortar into our chain footer, wall. chain wall, footer. Okay. That's going to spread all the water inside of the rain garden. These storms we experience here in Louisiana are quite devastating. We see impacts such as anxiety, depression, stress. A recent study said the pain is felt globally. About 85% of the world's population is already feeling the effects of human-caused climate change. Everything from worsening storms to more frequent wildfires and heat-driven health issues. We're seeing the impacts of these repetitive disasters we're experiencing in Louisiana, and there's also intergenerational trauma. And if it's not addressed, um, you know, then the issues will just continue. Angie Lastman, NBC News. Interesting stuff down there. NBC News covers hundreds of stories each day, and you know, it's tough to read, watch, and listen to everything, so our bureau teams have kind of done it for all of us. And this is what they say is going down in their regions. They call, and we call it the local. From our Northeast Bureau, the Department of Justice announced today that agents busted a high-end brothel network operating near Boston and parts of Virginia. Elected officials, doctors, and military officers were apparently among the clientele. Three people have been arrested 
on prostitution charges, that according to the criminal complaint. Out of our Southern Bureau, police in Oklahoma arrested the owners of that Colorado funeral home where almost 200 decomposing body bodies were discovered. The pair is accused of forging cremation certificates and improperly storing bodies. The owners are facing multiple charges, including money laundering, theft, and forgery. And also from our Southern Bureau, hunters in the Florida Everglades. You got to look at that photo. They've caught one of the heaviest Burmese pythons ever in the state. This massive snake, it weighs almost 200 pounds, measures 17 feet long, two inches. The hunters say it took them five of them, five total and 45 minutes to wrangle that snake. Man, not for me. Coming up, Amazon's newest move means that you could get health care in your Prime subscription. Health care in your Prime subscription. We'll explain after the break. We're back. Okay, all of you young parents out there, listen up. Your baby's lounger might not be keeping them safe. Infant support items like cushions, loungers, and tummy time pillows, they've been linked to at least 79 baby deaths over a 12-year period. That according to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And now the agency is proposing major changes for these items in order to meet new standards. We want to bring in NBC News national investigative reporter Susie Kim. She's been all over the story. All right, Susie, walk us through the new recommendations and what are they meant to do? Sure. So these are recommendations that the CPSC staff has proposed. They would be the first time the federal government has ever introduced safety regulations for these products. Basically, they would make them firmer, as firm as a crim mattress, flatter and thinner. And the hope is that babies who do end up falling asleep in this products would be less likely to suffocate or less likely to asphyxiate if their bodies yeah. get stuck in a position. Or to roll over, over, I guess, yes. right? <clears throat> so, and the hope is also that by redesigning these products in this way, caregivers will be less likely to use them mm -hmm. for sleep, to step away from their children, um, you know, to do a task in which, you know, newborn babies can fall asleep in mm -hmm. just a few minutes' time. So th this would be a major overhaul. Basically, um, the staff says that um, almost every product on the market out there in this lounger category, in this sort of baby cushion category, would have to be resigned to meet these federal safety guidelines if they are adopted. Uh, I had a good friend whose baby died of SIDS, and he has been on a warpath about this very issue. So if parents do right now still have these items, what should they do to avoid any suffocation issues? Should they remove them right now? So basically, manufacturers have said, and they say, um, continue to say, that these products are safe if they're used and it's intended. And that means supervising your baby and not letting your baby fall asleep. Basically, if your baby does fall asleep, you should move them to a safe sleep service, mm. which is something that is firm and flat, like a crib, a bath and at something of that sort. Um, obviously, you should also check, though, if your product has been recalled, as there have been prominent recalls of baby lounger items that the CPSC has decided simply aren't safe to be sold right now. And in my friend's case, uh, his baby died at a daycare that was using this type of, of uh, as I understand it, a pillow or the bedding. So I guess you've also got to be aware of what your daycare is yes, doing. Yes, no, absolutely. And that is, unfortunately, we did our own investigations and we found multiple cases in which that was the case in which it was the daycare provider that mm. put their baby in a non-sleep safe environment. So yes, I think it, the important thing is to be vigilant. And, um, you know, if your baby's at a daycare or even at a family or a friend's house, um, to understand mm. the sleep environment that they're in and make sure they're this safe. Is good info and parents out there should Go to NBCNews.com and share your article with other parents, right? Because young parents know other young parents. Get the word out. Absolutely. Susie, thank you very much. Uh, we have more news here that may make headlines with you. Amazon making a big move today as it tries to break into the already massive and competitive health care industry. Now, today, the world's largest e-commerce company announced it is going to start offering Amazon Prime subscribers, a way to get primary care, a doctor on the cheap. Prime members can now sign up for One Medical. It's a, a health service with clinics and doctors around the country. Amazon brought, one, or rather bought, I should say, One Medical for nearly $4 billion earlier this year. So let's get a look at how much this will actually cost you if you decide to sign up. Prime members can add One Medical to their subscription for $9 a month or $99 for a whole year. Non 
non-prime ministers, <laughs> prime members, he meant to say, are going to be paying $200 per year for the service. Uh, for more on this, let's bring in now Caleb Silver. He is the editor-in-chief of Investo Media Pedia. We're not talking about prime ministers. We're talking about prime members, Caleb. And Amazon has really been trying to make a big dent in this healthcare industry, right? Recently offering low-cost prescription drugs as well. This is a big deal. Yeah, this is a big deal. When you take the totality of Amazon's efforts into healthcare, this becomes an even bigger deal for the company. The CEO calling healthcare and health one of the pillars, the future pillars of Amazon. So this one medical deal, this is a company, as you said, Amazon bought for about $3.9 billion back in August. It is a primary care uh, facility and offering virtual care. For non-members, it's going to be $199. But you can add, if you're a member, family members for about six bucks each per month. So it's a pretty good deal if you're a prime member. And don't forget, there's about 168 million prime members here in the U.S. or so yeah. for Amazon. So it's got the embedded customer base and it's offering a low price primary care alternative. Uh, pretty widely dispersed across the country. Yeah, they're in about 20 major cities, about 200 clinics, but the virtual care is probably the biggest part of this because a lot of people are using that now. It's become very competitive. Amazon had its own virtual care business. They shut it down earlier this year, but now since they bought One Medical, who's an expert in this, they're leaning into their expertise and their physical presence around the country. So this, plus the drone delivery that Amazon is experimenting mm -hmm. with in College Station, Texas, uh, for prescription drugs, plus Amazon's other efforts tells you that the company is very serious about this. Well, you know, a lot of people are losing their docs because they're going to concierge medicine. So uh, this could be really an option. Amazon is a giant, though. Will this be a moneymaker for Amazon? They're going to bet big. Yeah, Amazon doesn't usually make bets where they lose money, although they've tried to get into health care earlier with J.P. Morgan and Berkshire Hathaway in a health service. They shut that down. They shut down the virtual service, and they restarted it with these new efforts. So you got to think that Amazon's going to swing big on this, and because it has that installed customer base through Prime, it's got a leg up, and it'll drive prices down for folks that do use boutique services. This is a much cheaper alternative. Well, and also importantly, this is happening when we're seeing consolidation, right? We're seeing pharmacies kind of grouping together. In some cases, they're actually buying health care providers. So this is a competition for, for those, for those pharmacists. Absolutely. Amazon is trying to get into every part of this market, drive the price down, and drive the customer service relationships it already has. Probably going to be very competitive here. Keep an eye on Amazon and health care for the next few years. Investopedia is Caleb Silver. Caleb, thank you. That's good information. We appreciate it. Still to come from us, a DC officially says goodbye to its beloved pandas. Why they're going home to China and how diplomacy has a role in this decision that's coming up next. All right, now to the talk of Washington today, not politics. Pandas. The National Zoo's last three giant pandas have now left on a return flight to China. You're looking at footage from earlier today of the father, the mother, and the baby pandas in their crates being loaded onto a FedEx plane ahead of a 19-hour flight back to China. It's a bittersweet moment, the result of 50 years of successful panda conservation at the Smithsonian, but deeply disappointing, a loss for the millions of panda fans in the States. And earlier this morning, I was at the Smithsonian National Zoo as the staff and visitors said goodbye. For 51 years, those black and white balls of fur have been the biggest stars at the Smithsonian National Zoo in Washington. At times, it's been pandamania. We're so excited to see the pandas. As visitors have come from around the world to gaze, gawk, and giggle in person and on the zoo's panda cams, at the frozen birthday cakes and bamboo delicacies, to toy juggling, tree climbing, snow sliding, to cuddling a newborn. They just look cuddly, and um, we just watched this little guy climb up into a tree. Amber and Cody Potter came here on their honeymoon. I had planned on bringing her here. She's talked about how much she loved the Smithsonian Zoo and getting to see the pandas. There's 25-year-old Mei Shang, 26-year-old Tian Tian, and 3-year-old Xiao Qi Ji. I think pandemonium is going to break out right here at the zoo. It was 1972 when pandas first arrived after President Nixon's historic trip to China, a diplomatic and panda conservation breakthrough. 
Since then, zoo visitors have met eight pandas, including four cubs born in D.C. Now the three remaining bears are heading back to China. For weeks, they've been getting used to their travel crates. The FedEx Panda Express plane has now left Dulles Airport for a 19-hour flight. Each crate filled with in-flight dining, 80 pounds of bamboo, butternut squash, sugarcane, and pears. Generally, the bears sleep for most of the flight, so that is what we are anticipating, but pandas have to eat for 16 hours a day. Their return, part of an agreement signed back in 2000, though it does come amid heightened tension between the U.S. and China. I am just, I'm going to be a mess. Uh, I will be a puddle of tears on that day because I know these animals. I know them as individuals. They mean so much to me. Yeah, tough day. Uh, and now that they are flying back to China, only the Atlanta Zoo is left with four pandas, and their agreement with China ends next year. As few as 1,800 giant pandas live in their native habitat, about 600 pandas live in zoos and breeding centers around the world. But thanks to the conservation efforts like the Smithsonian, they're no longer endangered. That's a wrap for this hour. Coverage with News Now picks up right now. coming on the air tonight from the spin room here in Miami. This is where the action is going to be a few hours from now after tonight's big NBC News Republican presidential debate. You're going to see all the latest reaction right here with five people, five candidates getting ready to take the stage as we speak. But you know who's not going to be on there? The overwhelming front runner, former President Trump. He's got his own event about 20 minutes, 30 minutes away with all the candidates now making their last minute prep. So a couple of questions. How does foreign policy play into this with the Israel Hamas war? raging as we speak. Plus, will that overwhelming win for abortion rights on election night for Democrats change Republicans' plan of attack? We've got a lot of angles covered. We've got a lot of correspondence watching all of it. Then, the former president's daughter on the stand today in that civil fraud trial against her father's company. Her moves in court to try to distance herself from the Trump empire and what to expect in the trial's next phase. We'll take you live outside to the courthouse. Plus, potentially dangerous chemicals now filling the air after a huge explosion at a Texas plant. People being told to stay inside. Schools being evacuated. We're going to have the latest from our teams on the ground. Then talks of a possible pause in fighting in Gaza with Israeli troops now in the heart of Gaza City. They're playing a high stakes game of cat and mouse with Hezbollah up north, too. We've got more on the tensions around the region. Plus, the FDA approving a new weight loss drug said to be better than anything on the market. But how safe is it? And how much is it going to cost you? We've got all that coming up a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we are coming on the air live from Miami. We are bringing our show to you from the spin room here of the third Republican presidential debate hosted by NBC News. Not going to lie, pretty empty here behind me. It is not going to look like that in a few hours from now. This place is going to be packed, and you are going to watch all of it right here. However you're watching, we've got our pre-show starting in just 60 minutes, then the debate, and then I'll be joined by Tom Yamas to talk you through all of it after, because guess what? These seats are about to start filling up. 1,500 seats in the audience here, with people in Miami ready to come to watch these five candidates take the stage. They're already here, I think most of them, and if not, they're starting to arrive at this point. We already saw many of them coming for walkthroughs. We have some video of that. They were checking the microphones, checking the podiums, getting a sense of what this is going to look like, what the vibe is going to be tonight, all that behind the scenes stuff that makes this actually happen. And if you're thinking, wait a second, Hallie, five candidates? Yeah, this is the smallest field that we've had on a debate stage so far. And you know what this means? Fewer candidates means more of an opportunity for any one of them to take more of the spotlight here. You know how talk time is always an issue? That's kind of less the case here because they're going to have two hours for them to make their case to voters as to why they should be the Republican pick to try to take on President Biden for the White House. But here's the thing. You know who's not on that list? Who's not on this graphic that we're showing you? This guy, former President Donald Trump. That is because he is going to be holding a rally in Hialeah, leading this race, frankly, by a mile in some of these key early states here. You're getting an overhead look now at all the people who are starting to pile into that. We're going to take you there live in just a couple of minutes. And that's the question here. What can any of the candidates do tonight that will help them chip away at the former president's lead? It's all happening against the backdrop of elections in some of these states you're seeing here. Virginia, Ohio, Mississippi, Kentucky. Democrats winning big on abortion rights, 
with that being the difference maker in some of these key races. Those results are really setting the stage, not just for tonight's debate, right, but for what we're going to see in the months to come here. Campaign 2024 here, as we are listening to voters all around the country as to what they want to see. Listen. Top thing on my mind, maybe um, have a better economy. I see that we are in a lot of debt right now. I, I feel that the immigration is really big to me. Immigrants are what make America, honestly. We're in a world of, of instability that we're all facing. It worries me a lot. I don't feel like the government should be telling us how to live our lives. Dasha Burns is live for us in Miami tonight. Ryan Nobles is up in Keene, New Hampshire, talking with voters with that primary there in just a couple months. Vaughn Hilliard is in Hialeah, which we showed you just a moment ago. Gabe Gutierrez is joining us from the White House now with more on where Democrats go from here. Dasha, I want to start with you, because let me tell you, since we last spoke about 60 minutes ago, I'm sure your phone's been blowing up. My phone has, right, with campaign sources trying to set the stakes, trying to set the tone for what they are thinking for their person come you know, two hours from now, right? It's 6 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Eastern is when this debate actually begins. Talk us through what we should be looking for, because I'll tell you, I'm really watching Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley. I think a lot of people are to see, as Nikki Haley surges in Iowa and Ron DeSantis starts to deflate a little bit, can either of them make the case that they should be seen as an alternative to Donald Trump, who's just stomping there by almost 30 points? Yeah, Hallie, that's the exact dynamic to watch. I'm in the debate hall now, feeling the vibes here. It's really quiet, the quiet before the storm where the fireworks are about to go off in here. And look, Ron DeSantis does come into this debate with perhaps the biggest endorsement of the primary, right? Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds, she is uh, very popular in her state, and it is the first uh, in the nation caucus state. So that means a lot. But again, as you said, Nikki Haley is the one who's really been surging. So it's going to be interesting to see how the two of them in interact with one another. The two are going to be trying to contrast uh, on issues of foreign policy. We've seen the attack ads flying between the two of them on the Israel-Hamas uh, issue. You've seen attack ads on China, uh, energy policy. So I'm going to be watching that. Uh, at the same time, you've got the issue of abortion. And those two are also vastly different on that issue. You had uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis sign a six-week abortion ban here in the state of Florida, whereas Nikki Haley has taken perhaps the most moderate stance of all of the candidates on that stage. So we're going to be watching that contrast. And of course, Hallie, the consolidation is going to have to happen. So what the big mission is going to be tonight for all these candidates, present themselves as the Trump alternative, try to turn this into That's a right. two-person race, which has to happen quick. Dasha Burns, live for us here from Miami, not too far away from where we're sitting. Dasha, thank you. One big question tonight, right? Who's going to be watching? Uh, how many people are going to be watching? What are they going to be watching for? Ryan Nobles is joining us. Ryan, i got to tell you, there's sometimes this dynamic that happens where you have sort of br brilliant pundits talking about what they think about these debates, and then you go talk to voters, and they think maybe something very different. That's why it's so important that you're there. You're posted up in New Hampshire for us. Classic restaurant diner situation. I am so curious. You're going to be watching the debate tonight with a group of voters there. What are they telling you they want to see? What are they looking for for right now? Hey. Yeah, you know, Hallie, we've already been out talking to New Hampshire voters ahead of this debate tonight to get a sense of what they're looking for. And the real sense you get from these voters is they want these candidates to focus on the issues that directly impact them. And I have a voter here with me uh, who talked to me about that already tonight, and that's Jimmy Tempesta. He is the owner of this establishment that we're going to be uh, watching the debate from tonight. He's been in the restaurant business for more than 30 years. So, Jimmy, what is it that you want to hear from these candidates tonight? Well, the main concern is, is being a small business owner like myself, and, and there's a lot, you know, that uh, it's harder now to be a small business owner. And I'm just, with the inflation and the gas prices and, and keeping a staff on, I have a lot of people here that work for me for many, many years, and it, you don't want to lose those. So, you know, with the inflation and everything that's going on, there's only so much I can charge a customer. Mm -hmm. And how high can I go? I can't get twenty five dollars for a hamburger, right. you know. And so those are important things to me. Yeah, you are my family. And you're really at the tip of the spear when it comes to the economy right now. Do you yeah. feel that these Republican candidates have talked enough about the economy, or at least solutions to make the economy better? Actually, that you say that, I, I'd like to see them talk about it more because I think that's one of the most important issues. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To keep the country going, and, and these small business guys. You know, I am the small, you know, hanging fruit from the tree 
but I am the guy that supports 39 people right. here that pay their mortgage, their car payments, and it's important for me to keep this going and teach my children that, you know, you work hard and you can get ahead in life, you know, and that's what I did. I started with a small restaurant, moved on up, and taught my kids good values, and I am that American dream guy, All right. you know what I mean? Well, great. Well, we're going to watch the debate with Jimmy, his uh, customers, and many other Republicans here in New Hampshire who are looking for that candidate that's going to zero in on the issues that Jimmy talked about that are important to them. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see, Hallie, how they react in real time, and we'll have it for you here tonight on NBC. Hallie? Can't wait to watch. Ryan Noble's live for us there in New Hampshire. Good to see you there, Ryan. Thank you. Vaughn Hilliard is also out in the field. He is in Hialeah, not too far from where I'm sitting, Vaughn, but certainly far enough, right? Because the bottom line is Donald Trump is not on the stage. It's just a few hallways down from where I'm sitting here. Um, he is saying in an interview that he would be open to, for example, having former Fox News host Tucker Carlson be his running mate. He is getting an endorsement from the Arkansas governor, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, his former press secretary. He is doing a lot, it seems, to try to take some oxygen away from what's going to be happening here. Here tonight. Talk me through strategy and what you're hearing from the sources you're in touch with. You're absolutely right, Hallie, and especially the difficulty for those five candidates on the stage is the fact that Donald Trump has such a sturdy lead with just 68 days until the Iowa caucus. We're talking about the latest NBC News Des Moines Register polling showing Donald Trump at 43 percent. The next up, both at 16 percent, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis. Donald Trump has long said for the first and second debate and now the third debate that there's no reason for him to, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these other candidates because he has such a solid, sturdy lead. And frankly, these other campaigns thought that uh, some indictments, uh, the major lawsuit out of New York, may chip into Donald Trump's lead. But that's not the reality that has been faced. And what you hear from voters that we talk to consistently is a doubling down that they believe that Donald Trump is being politically targeted in each of these prosecutions. And I want to let you just listen to a few of the voters who are here later today. They have nothing on Trump, you know, um, so I don't I don't worry about that. I don't worry. We have no concerns at all because we know that he's not guilty, that all this is a fraud for election interference. Even if he's in jail, I will vote for him. And so just because Donald Trump is not partaking in the debate doesn't mean that he's not having a political event. Hallie, we are just 10 miles from where you are here, and already thousands have come in. He is due to take the stage right about the same time that those other five rivals are taking the stage down where you are. Hallie? Vaughn Hilliard, we'll be looking for updates from you throughout the night. Thank you, friend. Appreciate it. So we talked about the big impact that abortion rights and the fight for abortion access has had on the elections that we told you about on this show 24 hours ago. What it has meant tonight is a win for Democrats, a win in Ohio, where abortion was quite literally on the ballot. Voters there ended up approving a measure that would constitutionally enshrine protections for abortion access in Kentucky. Abortion wasn't technically on the ballot, but boy, did popular Democratic Governor Andy Bashir sure run a campaign that largely put abortion rights front and center. And guess what? He won in Kentucky, in Virginia. You saw Democrats keeping their majority in the state Senate, flipping the state house, taking full control of the legislature there, even though the Republican governor of that state, Glenn Youngkin, had been largely campaigning on a 15-week abortion ban, with exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. That was soundly rejected here by Virginia voters. And what was a close race uh, with that state house now blue? Question is, right? Okay, fine. That's 2023. Let's look at 2024. What does it mean for 2024? I want to bring in Gabe Gutierrez, who's posted up outside the White House. Kamala Harris was asked this very question, the vice president today, Gabe, by one of our colleagues. How does she see the lens now for the 2024 campaign as both she and President Biden are on that Democratic ticket? Um, and it was interesting. She talked about how it was a good night for Democrats. It has been. But what we've also seen in these numbers is that support to protect abortion access outpaced support for President Biden generally. So in other words, a couple of things yeah. are true, right? Right? It was a good night for Democrats, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be smooth sailing for President Biden come next year. Exactly right, Hallie. And according to those NBC News exit polls, about 7 in 10 voters in Ohio do not want President Biden to run for re-election. But as of now, the Biden campaign highlighting those victories that you mentioned. And as you said, Vice President Kamala Harris also making that point today. She was asked by my colleague Monica Alba about that. Let's take a listen to what she said. I think the American people made clear that they are prepared to stand for freedom. So it was a good night, and the president and I obviously have a lot of work to do to earn our reelection, but I am confident we're going to win. 
And Hallie, I asked White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre whether the White House believed that abortion was the defining political issue heading into 2024. She wouldn't answer directly because of the Hatch Act, but she did say that she believed that the president's agenda was on the ballot last night. And to show you just how much the White House is leaning into this, just within the past hour, the president posting on social media that the extreme and dangerous MAGA Republican agenda is out of step with the vast majority of, a mention, uh, a vast majority of Americans specifically singling out reproductive rights. But as you said, uh, Hallie, according to exit polls, also 57 percent of Ohio voters disapprove of the job President Biden is doing. I asked Green Jean-Pierre whether this was a case of President Biden's agenda winning out or was it rather Democrats' agenda and not so much President Biden himself. She replied by saying that in Kentucky, for example, the campaign uh, for Daniel Cameron injected President Biden into the race, spending tens of millions of dollars, she said. And so that's why she believes that the president's agenda was on the ballot last night and that things look good going into 2024. Hallie? Gabe Gutierrez, it may be 2023 on the calendar, but it is certainly giving a lot of 2024 vibes for sure right now. Thank you very much. That does it for us here in Miami for now, but I'll see you back here in just about 45 minutes with my colleague Tom Yamas as we set up, talk through what we expect to see at this debate. Then, of course, you'll see the debate itself at 8 o'clock Eastern. However you're watching now, just stick wherever you are. And then in the post show after on NBC News and on NBC News Now. I want to toss it back home to Washington now with my friend and colleague Tom Costello, who's picking up the show from here. It's a busy news day, Tom, even outside of the world of politics. It is indeed. We'll be watching tonight. Hallie, good luck, and it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, hello from Washington. A lot happening. While the former president does his counter-programming against the debate tonight, his daughter Ivanka has been on the stand today trying to distance herself from her father's business empire that's wrapped up in that multi-million dollar civil fraud case. You see her walking out of court here earlier. She is the last member of the family to testify, and her lawyers question why she was, as they say, dragged there in the first place after attempts to get her out of appearing altogether since she is not a defendant in the case. Ivanka continually repeated that she was not involved in the company or her father's financial statements, which really are at the crux of this trial, with the attorney general arguing those financial statements were wildly inflated. We bring in now NBC's Rahema Ellis, who's been covering the story. She has the latest. Uh, the prosecution wrapped up examination today over Ivanka, and now it's up to the defense, right? What was your big takeaway from today? Well, it seems like this is just continuing the narrative, but in a much calmer way with Ivanka Trump being on the stand. She was asked about documents, financial documents and statements that might have been gone, that gone from the Trump organization to financial institutions in pursuit of loans, etc. She acknowledged that there were emails that she uh, exchanged with these institutions. But in terms of the details, she said over and over again, I do not recall. That was on direct examination. On cross-examination, the Trump attorneys got her to talk about the financial aspects of this. And she said, when asked, did you have any responsibility for preparing financial statements? No. Were you reviewing financial statements? No. Were you approving financial statements? No. So it's contrary to what the attorney general's office is suggesting that she or the family members were involved in. But but listen to what Letitia James, the state uh, attorney general, said who brought this case about Ivanka's testimony. She was disciplined. She was controlled. Um, and she was very courteous. But her testimony um, raises some questions with regards to its credibility, which will, which will be a question for the finder of fact. And that question of finder of facts, they're going to continue to try and pursue that. As you point out, Tom, this case continues uh, tomorrow with um, uh, information being exchanged in the courtroom in terms of just papers that they have to use. It's sort of uh, office keeping work, if you will. And then the defense will put on its yeah. case starting on Monday. Tom? You know, the AG mentioned credibility. She mentioned that she was composed. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, credibility was, a, was allegedly a problem, according to the judge and trial viewers, watchers of the former president when he was appearing uh, on the stand. How, how did she appear to you? 
She appeared to be the calm person in the room in terms of what happens in uh, the Trump family and the Trump organization, that she was the one who was measured, and she never got flustered. Um, and she also was not evasive, if you will. She was, um, again, I can't repeat it often enough, that she was calm, she was polite, she was not argumentative as her father was when he appeared here earlier this week, or, or brother Eric when he was appearing. She also didn't go in front of the cameras before or after going into the courtroom. She left what she had to say in the courtroom, speak for itself without anything other, uh, uh, otherwise. Unlike her father, who take a look at this full screen in terms of social media, he posted no victims, no defaults, conservative financial statements, 100% disclaimer clause, corrupt AG, Trump hating judge, no case. He gets involved even when he's not here. His daughter being here did everything she could almost to not be involved. Mm. Tom? Trying, trying to keep arm's length. All right, Rahema, thank you very much. Rahema Ellis in New York. Uh, we have news now out of the Middle East. The U.S. is at a, quote, critical stage of talks with Israel about, and Qatar about a possible pause in the fighting in Gaza. That, according to a pair of foreign diplomats familiar with this matter. Their goal is to allow more aid into Gaza and maybe even the release of more hostages. This is coming as Israel says its troops are now, quote, in the heart of Gaza City, carrying out coordinated attacks. That, according to Israel's defense minister, one of the main hospitals in Gaza City is now on its very last leg, we're told. The Palestinian Red Crescent Society says that after today, it will begin rationing electricity to just two hours a day in the hospital. This, while thousands of Palestinians continue to make that push south, away from Gaza City, some carried makeshift white flags to prevent being attacked. Israel has told them, go as far as you can for their own safety. Meanwhile, the White House is cautioning Israel not to reoccupy Gaza after the war, something Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu seemed to suggest just yesterday. Here's the Secretary of State today, Antony Blinken. It is imperative that um, the Palestinian people uh, be central to, uh, to governance uh, in, uh, in Gaza and uh, in the West Bank as well, uh, and that, again, uh, we don't see uh, a reoccupation. We've got our teams on the ground covering the region. Let's go first to NBC's Aaron McLaughlin, who is in Tel Aviv. Aaron, uh, what can you tell us about these talks about a, for a possible pause in the fighting? Well, these talks have been going on for weeks now, Tom, and according to a senior Arab source, they are at a critical juncture. What's on the table is a potential three-day pause that would allow humanitarian aid into Gaza and allow the hostages out. One diplomat telling NBC News that they would need anywhere from one to three days to allow a small group of the hostages, 10 to 15 hostages, to leave Gaza, but that that would also allow Hamas to figure out where the remaining hostages are located because apparently they do not know and that could potentially secure the release of hostages in the future. Now, a senior advisor to the Israeli prime minister telling MSNBC that the release of hostages is a, quote, possibility, but that he's urging caution and saying that he has nothing to announce as yet. The Israeli prime minister reiterated reiterating his stance that there will be no pause in the fighting uh, with or no, no ceasefire rather in the fighting without the full release of all 139 hostages. Now that is the hostage picture. We're hearing yeah. from the humanitarian community calling out for a five day pause. That is at a minimum, according to the ICRC, that they would need to stop the humanitarian catastrophe that is currently unfolding. In Gaza. You know, Aaron, I read somewhere today that uh, Hamas is now suggesting uh, this is far greater of an Israeli operation than they ever anticipated, a far greater uh, Israeli reaction. And the U.S. is opposing any sort of Israeli reoccupation of Gaza after the war. But is reoccupation looking like a possibility? We've got all these mixed messages tonight. 
Well, earlier this week, the Israeli Prime Minister raising a lot of eyebrows in the region, saying that once this war is over, that Israel is going to maintain security oversight of Gaza, quote, indefinitely, raising the prospect in many's minds of a potential reoccupation. Israeli officials scrambling after that statement to clarify, saying that Israel does not intend to reoccupy Gaza, that they're looking at a more fluid, more flexible security ar arrangement in which Israel would be able to go in for security purposes when it wants. How that's going to sit with the international community, well, that remains to be seen. The United States is saying not only should Gaza not be reoccupied, but Gazans also need to be able to determine their own political future. Tom. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin, who's in Tel Aviv. Aaron, thank you. And now we turn to what's happening further north on the border with the IDF and Hezbollah and fighting across the border between Israel and Lebanon. NBC's Josh Letterman is in Haifa, Israel, for us right now. He's been talking to the troops on that front line. Josh, what did you hear? Yeah, those troops, Tom, on the northern border, they are walking a fine line between deterring a wider war and starting one. Take a look. On one of the Middle East's tensest borders, Israel and Hezbollah are watching and waiting to see what the other does next. Sometimes exchanging fire, but not too much. Not enough, they hope, to start an all-out war, widening Israel's ongoing conflict with Hamas into an even deadlier regional battle. At this Israeli outpost just a few miles from the border, a group of troops has been camped out for a month on this stretch of dirt. When the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah shoots at Israel, they shoot back fast. They say that when the order comes, they have just four minutes to load up the cannon, uh, get the target aimed at the right place, and hit the fire button. They write handwritten notes on artillery shells, sarcastic messages for their Hezbollah targets. One in Hebrew saying, to Hezbollah from the summer camp with love. But while their cannon could shoot many miles into Lebanon, they often hold back, firing into a no man's land along the border. It's an unwritten language that Israel and Hezbollah have spoken with each other for years. Their vocabulary, the range and caliber of the weapons they use. Both sides understand what's just a tit-for-tat response and what's an escalation, at least they hope. How difficult is it to calibrate responses to attacks on Israel without escalating the situation? That's a good question. We have very clear and uh, simple rules of engagements. And the area of our responsibility, we know who we are, we, who we are able to shoot and who we won't want to shoot, not to escalate. And we take great measure of care to fire only upon uh, positions that we were fired from. Israel's government says it has no interest in war with Hezbollah, but is ready if it comes. That may be the only thing the two sides agree on. Hezbollah's deputy secretary general telling NBC's Matt Bradley it's engaging for the sake of distracting Israel, lowering pressure on Gaza, and that it's Israel's decision whether to expand the war. He says we are in a position of resistance and not of aggression. But military experts say even if neither side wants war, when two armed groups are firing daily, there's huge risk of miscalculation or misinterpretation. You never know what the, the signal event would be. The potential killing of a senior Hezbollah official, uh, the, the uh, wrong language rhetoric coming out of Israel. So there is tremendous uncertainty, great danger. Just today, Hezbollah is saying it targeted Israeli infantry troops in retaliation for an Israeli strike they say hit an ambulance. Israel says two of its troops were injured and that it responded with artillery into Lebanon. And this week, Hezbollah said it fired 122 millimeter Grad rockets at Israel, while Hamas militants in Lebanon launched rockets at Haifa, the deepest city in Israel targeted in the war so far. We were not surprised at all. We know for many years that uh, Haifa is a target and uh, we were prepared. Haifa is Israel's third largest city and its biggest port, with huge stores of chemicals and hazardous materials, raising fears that if a missile struck, it could look like the 2020 accident at Beirut's port just 80 miles away. Hundreds were killed in a chemical explosion. Haifa has been moving explosive chemicals away from the port just in case. If a missile comes over from Lebanon, how long do residents of Haifa have? Exactly one minute, 60 seconds. We always say to the people, if you don't enter the shelter in one minute, just lie down, put your uh, hands on, on uh, your head, and uh, we don't have more than one minute. 
And Tom, as fierce of a foe as Hamas is for Israel, Hezbollah is actually seen as a far mightier military force with literally thousands of precision guided rockets that can reach anywhere in Israel. And of course, they're both aligned with and backed by Iran. That is why there is such a high level of concern right now about the possibility of this war spiraling and Hamas fully entering this conflict. Tom. Josh, that's a great report. Thank you. Josh Letterman, who's in Israel for us. Uh, some breaking news just in. The U.S. military confirms that American fighter jets carried out strikes against targets in Syria this evening. In a statement earlier, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said the airstrike on a weapons storage facility is in response to a series of attacks by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and their affiliates against American air bases in both Iraq and Syria. Last month, the U.S. military launched similar self-defense strikes in response to a series of drone attacks on Americans, which led to the death of a U.S. contractor who suffered a cardiac arrest while he was seeking shelter. All right, now to that large chemical explosion that at a manufacturing plant in Texas, right now residents living nearby are being asked to stay inside their homes, but a shelter in place actually has been lifted. Smoke from the fire has been visible for miles. Firefighters say they've been able to get control of most of the fire. Just a few hot spots are left. We're told one employee was injured with what's described as minor burns. Other employees and students at a nearby school were safely evacuated. It's happening in Shepherd, Texas. That's about 60 miles outside of Houston. People living within a mile radius of that fire being asked to avoid unnecessary outdoor activity. A main highway remains closed to traffic. NBC News' Morgan Chesky, Chesky rather, joins me now from that city, Shepherd, Texas. Uh, Morgan, officials just gave an update. What did you learn? Yeah, Tom, I just had a chance to speak to the sheriff of San Jacinto County, where Shepard's located, and he tells me that he feels significantly more relieved now that they've been able to contain the fire inside that sound resource services plant uh, where that explosion occurred this morning. But he did say that staff will be remaining on site, checking the air quality for the surrounding communities and keeping an eye on those hot spots that you mentioned. That is going to be the big concern going forward, making sure there is not a reignition uh, of this plant that burned for uh, the better part of this morning and early afternoon just filling the skies around from where I'm standing with this black plume of smoke. Uh, it's tough to see now. That uh, is a testament to the work first responders were able to do and able to contain some of this fire. Uh, but I want you to hear what uh, representatives said with the company about the path going forward now that all of this has taken place. Take a listen. We have folks uh, going on scene currently as we speak to assess uh, the, the, the site and oversee uh, what needs to be done regarding remediation and cleanup. We'll be working with the company and contractors uh, through that process. Uh, we have mobilized two air monitoring vans that have been deployed from Austin and Beaumont. Now, the Texas uh, TCEQ, the state's environmental board, says that right now none of their air readings have contained any sort of high levels of chemicals. They are going to be checking that through the night, Tom. Uh, but right now, still definitely a level of concern here uh, in Shepherd, uh, despite the progress that's been made today. Tom. Morgan, thank you. Morgan Chesky on the ground for us. Coming up, you've heard about uh, the bed bugs in Paris. Well, now another country trying to fight the same problem for the first time in, in about 50 years. We're going to tell you where this is a problem later in the hour. Plus, General Motors is recalling an entire unit of driverless cars while regulators say the cars are dangerous to the public. Stay with us. We're coming back. Bottom of the hour, we're back, and we have a health news headline. The FDA today approved another weight loss drug with some promising results in clinical trials. This is called ZepBound, and it helped people lose up to 52 pounds in just 16 months. That, according to the drug maker Eli Lilly, that's better than anything currently on the market, including Ozempic and Wagovi. But it comes with a very hefty price tag. A month's supply, listen to this, costs over $1,000 without insurance. Still, some experts believe that ZepBound could eventually become the biggest selling drug ever, with annual sales projected between $25 and $48 billion. 
Natalie, how is this drug different from what's already available out there? So, Tom, let's just get all of this in order and people can keep these names straight. We have Ozempic and Wigovi, and now we have Manjaro and this new name, Zepbound. Manjaro and Zepbound are the same active ingredient, terzepatide, Ozempic and Wigovi have the same active ingredient called semaglutide. And what's happened with Zepbound, the same thing happened with Ozempic and Wigovi, and that is first a medication is approved to treat type 2 diabetes, and then lo and behold, they find in clinical trials that the medication also results in weight loss. It gets branded differently, sometimes different dosing, etc., and voila, you have a new medication. So in terms of it being similar or different, it's exactly the same as Manjaro, um, and it's slightly different than Ozempic and Wigovi because it, it impacts or targets two different hormones instead of one, but basically achieving uh, the same thing, which is weight loss, tremendous weight loss, as well as treatment yeah. of type 2 diabetes. Okay, so who should be taking this? Who should not be taking it? And I'm, I'm always worried about what we don't know, right? First of all, what are the side effects now? And what about down the road in five years? Are people going to be dealing with some really serious issue? Right. So right now, it is very specifically indicated for individuals who are either obese or who are overweight but have another risk factor for heart disease. So, for example, hypertension, high cholesterol. The most common side effects, Tom, are GI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, typically can be alleviated by going very slowly when increasing the dose, um, you know, staying at a lower dose for a longer period of time. In terms of more serious side effects, there have been cases of pancreatitis, gallbladder issues, kidney issues. There are certain people who have a risk factor for certain thyroid cancers who shouldn't take it. In terms of longer term, we don't really have that data. Um, the medications, even in post-approval you know, marketing and, and surveillance, a couple of years, I don't think that there's any dose or cumulative dose-related side effects that we know of, but we don't know. Um, and certainly the drug makers are going to be required to monitor people for potential long-term side effects. Yeah, see, that makes me nervous, you know, because you don't know what you don't know. But let me also ask you this. Once you go on it, are you really on it for life? I mean, can you get off of it if you decide, I don't want to be on this anymore? So the medicines don't reset your system so that when you stop it, you are able to either continue, maintain, or achieve the same kind of weight loss. They work in a variety of different ways to achieve weight loss. They slow gastric emptying. They reduce cravings. They do a lot of other things sort of to your metabolic profile, Tom. But when the medicine is stopped, the effect lasts for a couple of weeks, and then it's thought to really revert back to baseline. And one other side effect that should, should be of note because there was some press about it is this concept of slowing uh, the gut down. That's called gastroparesis and in certain cases did result in potentially you know, significant even, even surgical emergencies because of that. So not without potential risk, but they can be used safely in the right population, but they do need to be um, administered by and, and monitored by an expert who knows uh, you know, how to safely uh, prescribe these medications, Tom. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you very much. Good info. Oh, geez, look what time it is. We've got to get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, House Republicans subpoenaed President Biden's brother, James Biden, and the president's son, Hunter Biden, as part of their impeachment inquiry in the House. The men are requested to appear for depositions next month. Hunter Biden's lawyer said that this is a political stunt. A representative for James Biden did not immediately respond to request for comment. Number two, Meta announcing today that all it will now require political advertisers running ads on Facebook and Instagram to disclose if they were created with AI. Those political ads will have a specific label on them. The policy will start January 1st and it goes worldwide. Number three, this is important, General Motors is recalling all, all of its 950 cruise driverless cars after one of them dragged a pedestrian across a road last month, the cars will get a software update, so this type of problem hopefully won't happen again. Cruz also has appointed a chief safety officer after the incident. Number four, next year's Met Gala theme has been revealed. It's going to be Sleeping Beauty's reawakening fashion. The museum says its exhibit will be, quote, using the natural world as a visual metaphor for the transience of fashion. 
I don't know what that means either, but the gala will be held in May, and so we'll be watching. Number five, this October was the hottest one ever. It's not your imagination, ever recorded globally. It was 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the last record for October back in 2019. Scientists say this new record makes it very, very likely that this year, 23, will be the hottest year ever recorded. We're not done. When we come back, that so-called super fog in Louisiana forcing a major highway to shut down again. Why it keeps happening and what you should know if you're going to get caught in it down in the bayou. That's next. All right, well, guess what? That super fog situation on the southeastern part of the U.S. is getting even more serious. Now, take a look at this. Driving the freeway and you can't see a thing. Look at that fog coming up because you're caught in the super fog, which is a mix of dense fog and smoke, visibility near zero. And that's why authorities in New Orleans had to close an interstate again today. The smoky conditions have been blamed for a really just a spate of recent pileups across Louisiana, including one yesterday where one person died. NBC meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now. And, Bill, I'm thinking about that Dave Matthews song, song down on the bayou <laughs> playing in the back of my head. Uh, what is super fog? Can you explain it a little bit better than I just did? And what will it take for it to dissipate? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we've gone, I've gone 20 years here at NBC, and I've never once before the last two weeks mentioned super fog or even had a super fog event. Of course, we had the horrendous pile up, 150 cars, seven fatalities about two weeks ago. Then yesterday, we had another fatality because of the super fog. So here we are again, and con conditions just haven't changed. So here's New Orleans. Here is the, the fire that's causing all the problems. It's in the peat moss. It's in the marsh. It's a swamp fire. You can't just, like, send fire trucks out there or dump water on it. A lot of it even burns underground. And so the smoke from that... We'll just go in whatever direction the wind's blowing. And lately, it's been out of the south and heading towards the north and towards the northwest, right over I-10. So this is the section that they've had to close. And then at night, if, you know, we get the cooler air, especially in the fall when it drops to the ground because the cool air sinks, that's when you get the moisture droplets on top of this. And that's why we just get these really bad visibilities. And it's not widespread either. So will it happen again tonight? High pressure still over the head. There's no rain. There's no clouds. Nothing. So as the night goes on, we do expect the fog to form and not just on this area where we're probably going to have more road closures in the morning but all through Louisiana and southern Mississippi we're under a dense fog advisory like 1 a.m. it starts to mix out about 9 a.m. it should be all over with by about 10 a.m. and these conditions are going to keep repeating this fall until we get some rain in this region we are about 99 percent of the state of Louisiana is in drought uh, much of it is in exceptional drought you know, we talked about the California drought for like decades this has been going on for about six months now and it hasn't gotten any better and now spreading into Mississippi, Tom. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if new fires form and we keep talking about this until we finally get some drenching rain in the south. You know, state troopers always say if you're caught in fog, don't turn on your brights. Use your yeah. fog lights. Uh, what do you do if you're in this kind of super fog? Yeah, well, first off, you have to know that for the potential to be there because this is what they call like patchy fog. You know, you could be totally fine. You're driving for like an hour and then all of a sudden you get to like a bridge or by a river and all of a sudden it's just like driving into pea soup. And that's when people get in trouble to hit their brakes, to hit a car ahead of them. You don't have the visibility. So they're telling you, you have to first off be ready for the sudden changes in visibility. You know, the low beams, as you mentioned, the high beams just amplify the moisture droplets in the air, make it harder to see. And obviously you have to drive slowly and just try to keep your distance. You want to be able to see the red lights from the tail lights ahead of you, but you don't want to be so you know too close to those. And again, if you know there's you know water or bridges coming, that's where it's going to be the worst. Hopefully tomorrow morning it won't be as bad. Maybe flash the emergency blinkers while you're driving. That's yeah, a good idea. All right, Bill. Thank you very much. You know, NBC News covers hundreds of international stories each day, and it's awfully tough to read, to watch, to listen to all of them. So our international teams have done it for all of us. And here are some of the things they say they're keeping an eye on. It's a segment we call the global. To South Korea, officials there are ramping up pest control measures after reports of suspected bed bug infestations. The cases are apparently in some saunas and a college dorm. The prime minister's office is launching a four-week campaign to inspect public facilities for the bugs. Yuck. In Mexico, the country's Congress held another hearing over those alleged non-human mummies found in Peru. A Mexican journalist and a team of doctors presented evidence that they say supports the idea that the mummies are, quote, not part of our terrestrial evolution. Ooh. 
In 2017, the Peruvian government pushed back on similar claims, saying, no, they're not UFOs. The supposed bodies were human-made dolls covered in paper and glue. To Switzerland now, a super rare flawless blue diamond sold for nearly $44 million at a Christie's auction in Geneva. It's named the Blue Royal and at a whopping 17.6 carats, it's one of the most expensive diamonds ever. Coming up from us, a new warning today for parents why safety experts are recommending big changes to your baby's lounge. We're back. Okay, all of you young parents out there, listen up. Your baby's lounger might not be keeping them safe. Infant support items like cushions, loungers, and tummy time pillows, they've been linked to at least 79 baby deaths over a 12-year period. That according to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And now the agency is proposing major changes for these items in order to meet new standards. We want to bring in NBC News national investigative reporter Susie Kim. She's been all over the story. All right. All right, Susie, walk us through the new recommendations and what are they meant to do? Sure. So these are recommendations that the CPSC staff has proposed. They would be the first time the federal government has ever introduced safety regulations for these products. Basically, they would make them firmer, as firm as a crim mattress, flatter and thinner. And the hope is that babies who do end up falling asleep in these products would be less likely to suffocate or less likely to asphyxiate if their bodies yeah. get stuck in a position. Or to roll over, over, I guess, yes. right? <laughs> So, and the hope is also that by redesigning these products in this way, caregivers will be less likely to use them mm -hmm. for sleep, to step away from their children, um, you know, to do a task in which, you know, newborn babies can fall asleep in mm -hmm. just a few minutes' time. So th this would be a major overhaul. Basically, um, the staff says that um, almost every product on the market out there in this lounger category, in this sort of baby cushion category, would have to be resigned to meet these federal safety guidelines if they are adopted. Uh, I had a good friend whose baby died of SIDS, and he has been on a war path about this very issue. So if parents do right now still have these items, what should they do to avoid any suffocation issues? Should they remove them right now? So basically, manufacturers have said, and they say, um, continue to say, that these products are safe if they're used and it's intended. And that means supervising your baby and not letting your baby fall asleep. Basically, if your baby does fall asleep, you should move them to a safe sleep service, mm. which is something that is firm and flat, like a crib a bassinet, something of that sort. Um, obviously, you should also check, though, if your product has been recalled, as there have been prominent recalls of baby lounger items that the CPSC has decided simply aren't safe to be sold right now. And in my friend's case, uh, his baby died at a daycare that was using this type of, of uh, as I understand it, a pillow or the bedding. So I guess you've also got to be aware of what your daycare is yes, doing. Yes, no, absolutely. And that is, unfortunately, we did our own investigations, and we found multiple cases in which that was the case in which it was the daycare provider that mm. put their baby in a non-sleep safe environment. So yes, I think it, the important thing is to be vigilant and, um, you know, if your baby's at a daycare or even at a family or a friend's house, um, to understand mm. the sleep environment that they're in and make sure they're this safe. Is good info and parents out there should go to NBCNews.com and share your article with other parents, right? Because young parents know other young parents. Get the word out. Absolutely. Susie, thank you very much. Uh, we have more news here that may make headlines with you. Amazon making a big move today as it tries to break into the already massive and competitive health care industry. Now, today, the world's largest e-commerce company announced it is going to start offering Amazon Prime subscribers a way to get primary care, a doctor on the cheap. Prime members can now sign up for One Medical. It's a, a health service with clinics and doctors around the country. Amazon brought, one, or rather bought, I should say, One Medical for nearly $4 billion earlier this year. So let's get a look at how much this will actually cost you if you decide to sign up. Prime members can add One Medical to their subscription for $9 a month or $99 for a whole year. Non Non-prime prime ministers, <laughs> prime members, he meant to say, are going to be paying $200 per year for the service. Uh, for more on this, let's bring in now Caleb Silver. He is the editor-in-chief of Investo Mediapedia. We're not talking about prime ministers. We're talking about prime members, Caleb. And Amazon has really been trying to make a big dent in this healthcare industry, right? Recently offering low-cost prescription drugs as well. This is a big deal. 
Yeah, this is a big deal. When you take the totality of Amazon's efforts into healthcare, this becomes an even bigger deal for the company. The CEO calling healthcare and health one of the pillars, the future pillars of Amazon. So this one medical deal. This is a company, as you said, Amazon bought for about $3.9 billion back in August. It is a primary care uh, facility and offering virtual care. For non-members, it's going to be $199. But you can add, if you're a member, family members for about six bucks each per month. So it's a pretty good deal if you're a Prime member. And don't forget, there's about 168 million Prime members here in the U.S. or so yeah. for Amazon. So it's got the embedded customer base and it's offering a low price primary care alternative. Uh, pretty widely dispersed across the country. Yeah, they're in about 20 major cities, about 200 clinics, but the virtual care is probably the biggest part of this because a lot of people are using that now. It's become very competitive. Amazon had its own virtual care business. They shut it down earlier this year, but now since they bought One Medical, who's an expert in this, they're leaning into their expertise and their physical presence around the country. So this, plus the drone delivery that Amazon is experimenting mm -hmm. with in College Station, Texas, uh, for prescription drugs, plus Amazon's other efforts tells you that the company is very serious about this. Well, you know, a lot of people are losing their docs because they're going to concierge medicine. So uh, this could be really an option. Amazon is a giant, though. Will this be a moneymaker for Amazon? They're going to bet big. Yeah, Amazon doesn't usually make bets where they lose money, although they've tried to get into healthcare earlier with J.P. Morgan and Berkshire Hathaway in a health service. They shut that down. They shut down the virtual service, and they restarted it with these new efforts. So you got to think that Amazon's going to swing big on this, and because it has that installed customer base through Prime, it's got a leg up, and it'll drive prices down for folks that do use boutique services. This is a much cheaper alternative. Well, and also importantly, this is happening when we're seeing consolidation, right? We're seeing pharmacies kind of grouping together. In some cases, they're actually buying health care providers. So this is a competition for, for those, for those pharmacists. Absolutely. Amazon is trying to get into every part of this market, drive the price down, and drive the customer service relationships it already has. Probably going to be very competitive here. Keep an eye on Amazon and health care for the next few years. Investopedia's Caleb Silver. Caleb, thank you. That's good information. We appreciate it. Still to come from us, a DC officially says goodbye to its beloved pandas. Why they're going home to China and how diplomacy has a role in this decision that's coming up next. All right, now to the talk of Washington today, not politics. Pandas. The National Zoo's last three giant pandas have now left on a return flight to China. You're looking at footage from earlier today of the father, the mother, and the baby pandas in their crates being loaded onto a FedEx plane ahead of a 19-hour flight back to China. It's a bittersweet moment, the result of 50 years of successful panda conservation at the Smithsonian, but deeply disappointing, a loss for the millions of panda fans in the States. And earlier this morning, I was at the Smithsonian National Zoo as the staff and visitors said goodbye. For 51 years, those black and white balls of fur have been the biggest stars at the Smithsonian National Zoo in Washington. At times, it's been pandamania. We're so excited to see the pandas. As visitors have come from around the world to gaze, gawk, and giggle in person and on the zoo's panda cams, at the frozen birthday cakes and bamboo delicacies, to toy juggling, tree climbing, snow sliding, to cuddling a newborn. They just look cuddly, and um, we just watched this little guy climb up into a tree. Amber and Cody Potter came here on their honeymoon. I had planned on bringing her here. She's talked about how much she loved the Smithsonian Zoo and getting to see the pandas. There's 25-year-old Mei Shang, 26-year-old Tian Tian, and 3-year-old Xiao Qi Ji. I think pandemonium is going to break out right here at the zoo. It was 1972 when pandas first arrived after President Nixon's historic trip to China, a diplomatic and panda conservation breakthrough. Since then, zoo visitors have met eight pandas, including four cubs born in D.C. Now the three remaining bears are heading back to China. For weeks, they've been getting used to their travel crates. The FedEx Panda Express plane has now left Dulles Airport for a 19-hour flight. Each crate filled with in-flight dining, 80 pounds of bamboo, butternut squash, sugarcane, and pears. Generally, the bears sleep for most of the flight, so that is what we are anticipating, but pandas have to eat for 16 hours a day. 
their return part of an agreement signed back in 2000, though it does come amid heightened tension between the U.S. and China. I am just, I'm going to be a mess. Uh, I will be a puddle of tears on that day because I know these animals. I know them as individuals. They mean so much to me. Yeah, tough day. Uh, and now that they are flying back to China, only the Atlanta Zoo is left with four pandas, and their agreement with China ends next year. As few as 1,800 giant pandas live in their native habitat, about 600 pandas live in zoos and breeding centers around the world. But thanks to the conservation efforts like the Smithsonian, they're no longer endangered. That's a wrap for this hour. Coverage with News Now picks up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.